we're going to win. Anybody here from Ottawa? <laughs> Okay. Any player else? What? Calgary. Okay. Uh -huh. Nice to see all of you. I'm happy you could come and take this opportunity to come together in here and chant. I hope I can say something to contribute to that effort. I don't even know what I'm going to speak about yet. Uh, which is typical. Uh, I was thinking on the way over of a verse and uh, I'll tell you why I was thinking about it after I find the verse. Um, it's Balad Maharaj. Uh, Seventh canto, ninth chapter. I always like Pallad Maharaj's prayers and verses from Pallad Maharaj. I find them to be very profound because they come from the mouth of a five year old boy. And uh, he really, uh, when he speaks, it's obvious how could anybody who's five years old speak with such profound wisdom. You generally we think of wisdom as something that's accumulated over the course of a lifetime. In fact, Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains in his Chaitanya Shikshamrita that one of the reasons why in Vaishnava culture there's respect to elders is because the elders are supposed to have wisdom. Wisdom means that you know, they have life experience and uh, it's very much part of it. Uh, mentions about it several times. But how is somebody who's five years old and has so much wisdom, obviously there must be something that's preceded that birth to have so much wisdom at the age of five. I mean, just like one of the verses, I, I so many verses of Pallad Maharaj, one of the verses I oftentimes quote from Pallad Maharaj is the verse he says, in this material world, Every materialist is endeavoring for happiness and, uh, and trying to avoid distress. Actually, however, one cannot be happy as long as he begins his endeavor, as long as he endeavors for happiness, because as soon as he begins his endeavors for happiness, immediately he creates all his conditions for distress. Simple statement, but profound. Five-year-old boy. <laughs> As soon as you begin your endeavors for happiness, you create all your distress. Of course, obviously somebody has to be conversant with the, with the laws of karma to make such a statement. And of course, we know one of the major factors of Prahlad Maharaj's spiritual wisdom was the fact that uh, he heard from within the womb of his mother the transcendental instructions from Narada Muni. I oftentimes quote this too. Sometimes parents ask me, what can I do for my child? <laughs> it's before the child's born. <laughs> and Pallad uh, Maharaj is a perfect example of what parents can do for their child. Uh, what was her name? Krita Duty? What was Pallad's mother? Kayad. 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 That's right. Kayad. She was hearing. She was staying in the ashram of Narada Muni, and she was hearing daily recitation of the transcendental topics of the Lord's pastime, Srimad Bhagavatam. And as a result of her hearing, and because of Prahlad's presence in her womb, he became transcendentally enlightened, uh, even within the womb. So, <clears throat> we have so many examples in the Bhagavatam of, of persons who have profound wisdom, but as a result of some previous contact, not even in this life, but some previous contact. So therefore, it gives us a little sense that wisdom also is something that's accumulated not only in this lifetime, but over many lifetimes. Uh, 
So <coughs> the verse I was thinking of, and I'll tell you why I was thinking of it, is Prahlad Maharaj. I have to find it. I quote it a lot. Balasya neha sharanam pitaro nishinga Nartasya jagadam udanvati majatu nao Tatasya tat patividir Yahi hanjasheshtas Tavad vibhavatan ubritam tvad upekshatanam This is his prayer to Nishinga Dev. He's saying, My Lord Nishinga Dev, O Supreme, because of a bodily conception of life, embodied souls neglected and not cared for by you cannot do anything for their betterment. Whatever remedies they accept, although perhaps temporarily beneficial, are certainly impermanent. For example, father and mother cannot protect their child. A physician in medicine cannot relieve a suffering patient. And a boat on the ocean cannot protect a drowning man. Purport. Through parental care, through remedies for different kinds of disease, and through means of protection on the water, in the air, and on land, there is always an endeavor for relief from various kinds of suffering in the material world. But none of them are guaranteed measures for protection. They may be beneficial temporarily, but they afford no permanent benefit. Despite the presence of a father and mother, a child cannot be protected from accidental death, disease, and various other miseries. No one can help, including the parents. Ultimately, the shelter is the Lord, and one who takes shelter of the Lord is protected. This is guaranteed. As the Lord says in Bhagavad Gita 9.31, Kaunteya Pratijani hi na me bhakta pranasyati. O son of Kunti, declare it boldly that my devotee never perishes. Therefore, unless one is protected <coughs> by the mercy of the Lord, no remedial measure can act effectively. One should consequently depend fully on the causeless mercy of the Lord. Although as a matter of routine duty, one must of course accept other remedial measures. No one can protect one who is neglected by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In this material world, everyone is trying to counteract the onslaught of material nature, <coughs> but everyone is ultimately fully controlled by material nature. Therefore, even those so-called philosophers, scientists, try to surmount the onslaught of material nature, they have not been able to do so. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 13.9, that the real sufferings of the material world are four, janma, mrityu, jaravyadhi, birth, death, old age, and disease. In the history of the world, <coughs> no one has been successful in conquering these miseries imposed by material nature. Prakriti, kriyamana, nigunai, kamani, savasa. Nature, prakriti, is so strong that no one can overcome, overcome her stringent laws. So-called scientists, philosophers, religionists, and politicians should therefore conclude 
that they cannot offer facilities to the people in general. They should make vigorous propaganda to awaken the populace and raise them to the platform of Krishna consciousness. Our humble attempt to propagate the Krishna consciousness movement all over the world is the only remedy that can bring about a peaceful and happy life. We can never be happy without the mercy of the Supreme Lord. Tvat Upekshatanam. If we keep displeasing our Supreme Father, we shall never be happy within this material world, in either the upper or lower planetary systems. Hmm. Why did I think of this first? I, should, I said I was going to tell you what. And uh, I was thinking that when I stood up, I was in so much pain. <laughs> I have a lot of pain sometimes. It comes and goes. And it, I was trying to remember sometime at what time, what Prabhupada said. Uh, I know one time, it was in Puri. And uh, the devotees were walking along mm, the beach in Puri. Prabhupada was walking with his cane. And the other devotees were walking, walking with him. And Prabhupada turned to them and said, I remember I was here once before. I was in the Kadi Dodi and I was running and jumping. And in the waves. <laughs> now he was walking with King, very slow, deliberate steps, and he turned to them and said, Don't think this won't happen to you. <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> that was Prabhupada's wisdom. He shared. I'm sure he shared it more than once, but. That's one I seem to remember. Don't think this won't happen to you. And uh, I can say that when I was young, I definitely wasn't thinking like Balad Maharaj with his profound wisdom. I was thinking, it's not going to happen to me. <laughs> Especially when you're young. Of course, Balad Maharaj said so many things to his friends in this classroom trying to awaken them to the transcendental wisdom. He was telling them to be careful, not to spend their life. He said, now that you're young, uh, you may think that, yes, you can enjoy. He said, but this life, there's not much uh, to this life. He said, in the beginning, childhood is spent uh, in frivolous activities. Uh, in old age, uh, is spent uh, simply trying to counteract the effects of old age. <laughs> and then he talks about the first 20 years of the life, the last 20 years of the life, Fif then 50% of the life is spent sleeping. You don't have much <laughs> life of vitality. You should think a little bit more conscientiously how to use this, wise, this life wisely five-year-old boy telling his five-year-old classmates his wisdom about the nature of life, the <laughs> transitory nature of this life and the fleeting nature and uh, how it goes by very, very quickly. And sometimes, I oftentimes marvel, especially I, there's a verse, Ayya Hariti Vai Pung Sam, Ujjan Yasta Chadayada Sao. The first can second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which states that both by rising and setting, the sun decreases the duration of life for everyone, except for one who utilizes the time for discussing the all good pastimes of the Supreme Personality of God. It's a verse I usually quote on New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve verse. New Year's Eve is usually people in the evening, everybody's out celebrating. They're celebrating that another year is gone. And, uh, and another year is 
time is passing, what's being accomplished? Another year is gone, which means both by rising and setting, is each day is bringing us closer to the termination of this life that people are celebrating. I, my conclusion is they're probably celebrating because they're hoping this is this year is going to be an, at least a new opportunity because last year brought so much <laughs> so many problems that maybe this year will be better. So they're celebrating, anticipating on January 1st it's going to be the bidding of a good year. Uh, but actually, time, one of the symptoms of time, which this is Kalosmi, I'm coming in the form of time and I'm destroying everything by the influence of time. Because of time, there is beginning. Because of time, there is uh, birth, growth, duration, production of byproducts, dwindling and vanishing. Everything in this world, by the influence of time, uh, is ultimately being destroyed and Krishna in the form of Kalarupa. The time factor, as he says, I'm destroying everything by the influence of time. Of course, that's the nature of this world. And as we know that you know, in this world, everything is Dukaliya Mashashvata, temporary and subject to be full of miseries. Krishna always explains there is, there is another place that's not under this influence uh, of time. He says that abode is un unmanifest and infallible, it is the supreme destination. When one goes there, one never has to come back. That is my supreme abode, not under the influence of time. And uh, I think Prabhupada even talks about this. Oops, excuse me. Stand up straight. There it is. <laughs> um, well, he's, he just simply says that, that in this material world everyone is trying to counteract the onslaught of material nature, but everyone's ultimately fully controlled by nature. Mm. But he says the only way that one can become overcome the onslaught of material nature is by awakening one's dormant Krishna consciousness. Therefore, uh, people are trying to stop the influence of time, birth, death, disease, and old age. But <clears throat> the only way to overcome the influence of these things is uh, by realizing one's eternal nature. So the reason why I was, as I said, I was thinking of this verse is I, I think oftentimes that, yes, I didn't, body's getting older, uh, so many different types of pains in the body, so many different problems and so many efforts that sometimes we have to make to try to counteract. And Prabhupada speaks about this, counteracting the effects of time. <clears throat> And he even said here, and it's an interesting point, and I oftentimes quote that, this point, from Srila Prabhupada's purport. He says, although as a matter of routine duty, one must, of course, accept other remedial measures. As a matter of routine duty, we have to make the effort. When the body is sick, we have to make an effort to try to overcome disease. Uh, um, and but Prabhupada explains that and this is verse by Pallad Maharaj is, as I said this is the verse of so much wisdom which says that yes without the blessings of the Lord whatever remedies that we may accept although perhaps temporarily beneficial they're, they're certainly impermanent they cannot provide the permanent solution to the problems of life and the essential point he makes is that we're always fully dependent upon the decision of the Supreme. We may make our plans, but even though we make our plans, and Pallad Maharaj uses the example, just like a person may have expert physician and best medicine. 
Yes. If we're told we have a very expert, the best doctor, who's brought with him medicine that he's convinced. And in fact, I remember. I remember our God brother, Shinar Maharaj, when I was with him in Mayapur. <coughs> when he was there, he had terminal cancer. Many of you know him, I'm sure. He was from Canada. Uh, and uh, he, uh, devotees were trying to push him. There was one devotee, his god brother named Tridandi. <laughs> and he said to Shira Maharaj, Maharaj, I know a doctor in South India. I'm sure we can do something. You know, can I bring this doctor? And uh, Maharaj, at this particular point, he was filled with a lot of wisdom. I'll give you one example. One example of his wisdom. And I'll get to the point also afterwards about the doctor from South India. <clears throat> Every night we would have kirtan. His body was uh, diseased and uh, filling up with fluids and he couldn't stand up, couldn't sit. He had to lie in, lie in the bed while all of us were in the room chanting Hare Krishna. And then uh, one evening, the room was filled with devotees. He sat down on his bed and he gave a lecture. And he, what was his lecture about? We're not these bodies. <laughs> he sat there, the most simple, profound, I mean, statements, you know, sitting on his bed and speaking at this very simple, very basic point we've heard so many times. But here's somebody speaking from realization. Realization. That we eternal spirit souls. We're parts and parcels of Krishna. This body is temporary. We should not invest so much energy in trying to uh, save this body because ultimately this body is meant for death. And if it's inevitable, if it's going to happen, we can try and make so many arrangements. And, but yet, without the blessings of the Lord, we, he was saying all these points in his lecture. He just spoke very, very briefly. But here's somebody who was speaking with realization. So much realization. And then he lied down again. <laughs> and he would oftentimes, of course he was known as the Jolly Swami, he would oftentimes make jokes about his bodily condition. You know, like the one time when the doctors were coming in and uh, they had to come in regularly because they had to take fluids out of his body because his body was filling up with fluids. <coughs> and his body was extended because of the fluids. And his two brothers were there in the room, Stu and Malcolm. And he turned to them and said, it's a boy. <laughs> 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 to lighten up the atmosphere. <laughs> it was everybody standing around. Just merely tries to lighten up the atmosphere. And not only that, another thing he did that was very profound. It's another I could, I could talk all day about Sridhar Maharaj, I love him. <laughs> but it's not, I'm not, I don't intend to do it, but, but another thing he did is, uh, I'll get to the doctor in South India. <laughs> Don't let me forget. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, many of his god brothers were there. One of the things he wanted, one of the things he wanted to accomplish, he wanted to be able to be with his god brothers before leaving this world. And that's why he was just, he was praying to, to Krishna, let me go to Mayapur. I, he, two things he wanted. 
He wanted to be there for the installation of Pachatattva, and he wanted to be with his god brothers and god sisters in Mayapur. And uh, of course, Krishna fulfilled his desire. The many god brothers were there. In fact, he had a little sign on the door, and the sign on the door said, uh, uh, "You know that he was ill. Please see his secretary." And uh, if you want to schedule a meeting with him. But in the big letters he said, God brothers, come right in. <laughs> I can't remember, he might have said God sisters too. I don't know if you remember last morning. <laughs> but it definitely I remember. God brothers, don't knock, come right in. <laughs> so anyways, actually many of us, we, uh, we developed you know, a bond very close bond with him because that's what he wanted. He wanted to be with, he wanted to be with his god brothers. He loved his god brothers, loved them. You know, just so grateful to be with them, and you really felt it. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I happened to be on my computer and I dug up a whole folder of pictures of him during these last few weeks, and you could see how much he just loved being with with his god brothers. So it was coming time, this is the story I wanted to tell, it was coming time to, uh, to uh, the, G the meetings were over, the festival is over, and many of the devotees were getting ready to leave. And Maharaj was still present, and many of the devotees, especially like, like myself, I was thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do, I don't know, you know, I kept on thinking, this is tough, this is going to be tough, I can't go in the room. I don't know what I'm going to say, because uh, I was getting ready to leave, and I was thinking, maybe I should stay, who knows, how, you know, maybe I should change my plane ticket. And it's just such a quandary in my mind. And when I walked into the room, getting ready, Shri Maharaj turned to me and said, What are you doing here? I said, Maharaj, uh, I just come. Get out of here! <laughs> he said, Get out of here! Go preach! Prabhupada wants you to preach! Go to Moscow! Get out of here! I'll see you in Moscow! He threw me out of the room. <laughs> he threw me out of the room. Literally. And... You know, <laughs> took me right off the mental platform. <laughs> he just settled the whole thing right then and there, you know, like he knew, he knew what was going through my head and he just didn't give me, he tried to put me out of my suffering, I guess, or something like that. Just told me, get out. And I couldn't say anything. I mean, he's my senior god brother. I had, I said, okay, Maharaj, I'll see you in Moscow. <laughs> And then I left. Of course, there's more to the story also. Maybe I can tell. Huh? In that whole month, he specifically asked that you regularly come and do kirtan for him. Yes, he did. He asked me. That was your gift to him. He did. He did ask me. He asked me to come. He liked my kirtans. And then when I met him in Mayapur, I embraced him. I said, when he arrived, I said, Maya. Because I missed the opportunity, I was supposed to go to Bombay. He called me once to come to his room in Bombay to have kirtan. He did it a few times, and I went. But one time I missed. So when I saw him in Mayapur, I embraced him. I said, Maharaj, 24-7, I'm yours. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, he wanted me to be there for kirtan. <laughs> Anyways, I was going to tell a story about the... I want to get back to the physician. And that is uh, one the god brother Tridandi was was uh, he was saying to Maharaj, I know an Ayurvedic physician, Maharaj, I'm convinced this Ayurvedic physician in South India, please let me go, please let me get him. Shri Maharaj was he's very skeptical. He said, if you insist, go ahead, but 
was a little skeptical. He just didn't had his doubts about it. And Sri Dandi, he did, went. He went to South India. He looked. He found the Ayurvedic physician. And then he brought him back to Mayapur. And the physician, you know, as he usually do, he take the pulse and prescribe medicine, prescribe diet. And, uh, you know, Sri Maharaj. <laughs> Diet. <laughs> I remember coming in one day when he was falling, and he was—he had to just look on his face like, "No, this is not going to work." <laughs> so, like you know, forget it. And uh, he didn't have that much faith. He had, he, he sensed that he wasn't going to be around that much longer, and he wanted to make the best use of his time. And he just, and as Prabhupada says here, as a matter of routine duty, he did it as a matter of routine duty. That was it. It was routine duty. Why well, he was trying to appease, literally, he was trying to appease a god brother who was trying really hard, and he took that as his duty, rather than saying no, don't do it. He accepted the offering. The offering of love, but he—he he was already in his mind. He was thinking how to how to prepare for leaving. And in fact, uh, when I, uh, I I wasn't planning on speaking on this, but it just came up spontaneously. Forgive me. I was going to speak. And it's connected to the verse, though. I think it's well connected, but it did come up spontaneously because. I guess it's my spontaneous affection for Shri Maharaj. I don't know. <laughs> I just. <clears throat> but uh, so when he threw me out of the room, I said, "Well, Maharaj wants me to." Go. And I was on my way to Kiev. I was on my way to Moscow. I was on my way to Kiev. <clears throat> and uh, I had to. I got a flight. I got a flight from. Calcutta to Mumbai, where I was connecting my connection flight, connecting flight to Europe, which was Germany probably going to Kiev. And uh, <clears throat> when I was in Mumbai, I had a night flight. It was leaving like around two o'clock in the morning. And then about midnight, I was just packed on my way to the airport. I got a uh, phone call from Mayapur, who was Shira Maharaj's servant, personal servant. And, uh, and Mayapur said, uh, Maharaj, I think you know that Shira Maharaj threw all his godbrothers out of Mayapur and told them to go out and preach. <coughs> I said, yeah, I was one of them. <coughs> he said, he said, it's really tough right now. No God brothers are here. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, what, are you thinking I should, I should do something? He said, no, maybe you know some God brothers. Maybe somebody can come. And there, I think there was. I think Hans Duda was there. But there, there weren't many God brothers. So I said, well, I'm in Mumbai right now. Radnath Maharaj is here. And I'm just on my way. I was literally on the way to the airport to Kiev. And uh, I said, I'll write a message and I'll leave it under the door for Radhanath Maharaj and I'll explain to him the situation. Maybe Radhanath Maharaj will be able to go. And I flew to Kiev. And uh, I couldn't change. The tickets couldn't, couldn't change. It was too late. It was two hours before the flight. <coughs> so... Uh, when I got to Kiev, the uh, following morning, I called and spoke to Shira Maharaj. No, excuse me, it was night. It was night time. That's right, it was night time. It was the night before Shiva's Pandit's appearance day. <clears throat> and uh, I called and, and, and spoke to Shira Maharaj and said, Maharaj, how are you? And he said to me, Naranjan Maharaj, okay, here's your opportunity. 
preached to me. So I, what are you saying? He said, she said, you have to convince me there's a reason to stay. He said, if you think there's a reason why I should stay, convince me. <clears throat> that was his first question. He asked me. You know, I said, what do you mean? He said, he said, there's no reason to stay anymore. I can't see any reasons to stay. He says, I think I should go. I said, but there's so much service. So many devotees love you. So many devotees are depending on you. And he said, I think you're going to have to preach a little more than that. <laughs> and uh, I did. I got up whatever, whatever I could muster up to try to instill with him. Because I didn't, I didn't know. I had no idea. I had no idea. But he, he had an idea. And after we were on, I was on the phone with him maybe about, about 45 minutes preaching to him, you know, to stay. And uh, then the following morning he left. He left. And, uh, and then I had the, a very difficult task to have to go and give a class for Shiva's Pandit's appearance day, like minutes after hearing of his departure. It was a real traumatic day for me. Yanila Pemadana. And we sometimes we pray, you know, Prabhupada even said that when Vaishnava is depart, there's no cause for lamentation. He reasons the ill who say that Vaishnava has died when thou art living still in silent. Vaishnava has died to live in a living sprite try to spread the holy name around. There's no cause of lamentation when a Vaishnava leaves, especially somebody who's been so dedicated in service to Srila Prabhupada. And as Prabhupada quotes right here and today, the best, reme best remedial measure is, to, is the widespread propagation of Krishna consciousness all over the world. That is the best service. And you've said the service to humanity Everybody else are trying to, everybody else is trying to overturn. Everybody else is trying to, what is the word that he uses sometimes to? Huh? Counteract. counteract, thank you. I was going blank. Counteract. Everyone is trying to counteract the laws of material nature. This is, but they there is no way to counteract the laws of material nature. There's only temporary ways to counteract the laws of material nature. The only permanent way is to become transcendental to the laws of material nature. That means to restore one's original Krishna consciousness, which is to restore one's personal relationship with the Supreme. And uh, Srila Prabhupada said this is the best remedial measure. So Prabhupada says, of course, as a matter of routine, we should try. We make some effort. But we should know, ultimately, in all of this, there is a divine plan. And it, wherever there is a divine plan, then a devotee uh, must learn how to dedicate his life in dependence on the Lord and the Lord's decision. Then, whatever his decision is, that's the best protection safest place to be in. Conscious, to be conscious of Krishna. Antakale chamameva smaran mukva kalevaram. Prabhupada talks about in this verse, Antakale chamameva smaran. He says, when he speaks about smaran, he says, the best way to remember Krishna at the time of leaving this world, he says, the best way to be prepared is by incessantly chanting Hare Krishna. Incessantly ch chanting Hare Krishna. This is our divine protection. Safest place is Kirtan Ras. Safest place. Nothing else can save us but Kirtan Ras, the nectar of Kirtan, which means to Lila Sankirtan, Nam Sankirtan, Guna Sankirtan, Rupa Sankirtan. It's all Kirtan Ras. 
hearing the glories of pastimes of the Supreme Lord, hearing the glories of the devotees of the Lord, hearing the, about the transcendental qualities of the Lord, transcendental beauty of the form of the Lord, uh, and hearing the glories of the holy name of the Lord. There's a verse in Chaitanya Charitamrita, spoken by Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, when Haridas Thakur went into a swoon of ecstasy after hearing a verse composed by Srila Rupa Goswami, where he was describing how much nectar there is in the two syllables Krishna. There is so much nectar in these two syllables Krishna that I desire thousands of ears and millions of tongues so that I can always hear and chant these two syllables Krishna. And when the, this transcendental vibration enters into the courtyard of my heart, it says then uh, my, my mind, uh, senses become stunned and my mind becomes inert. As a result of just simply by hearing this Krishna. And then, Lord Chaitanya, kind of prodded Rupa Goswami because he saw Rupa Goswami he was writing the verse on a, what did they write him on? Palm leaves. Palm leaves. Palm leaves. And when Lord Chaitanya came and said Rupa what is that? That is so beautiful what you have written. They look like beautiful pearls strung on a thread. His words that he had written on the palm leaf. He said please Tell me, Rupa Goswami. No. I was not so much inclined to disclose. But Lord Chaitanya insisted, please tell me. And then Rupa Goswami read the verse, and when he read the verse, Haridas Thakur, who was standing nearby, heard the recitation of that verse coming from the mouth of Rupa Goswami about desiring millions of ears and thousands of tongues and how dances in the courtyard of his heart and his, his mind becomes stunned his sense, his mind becomes inert his stunned, his senses become stunned and, and Haridas Thakur hearing that he fell down in, in complete transcendental ecstasy and hearing the glories of the holy name of the Lord and Kaviraj Goswami says that one has to hear the truth and beauty of the Lord's holy names one has to learn about the truth and beauty of the Lord's holy names by hearing the revealed scriptures from the mouths of Vaishnavas. There's no other way, no other way to taste the ecstasy in these names. This is Nam Sankirtan. Nam Sankirtan. Glorifying the holy name of the Lord. There's Nama Chintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Rasa Vigaha. Holy name is non different from Krishna, it's transcendentally, benef transcendentally blissful, it bestows all spiritual benedictions upon the living entity. It's not a material name under any circumstance, it's never any less powerful than Krishna himself. Such is the nature of Krishna's name. So, Kirtan Ras. Kirtan Ras means to, to safest place is to be absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. And then, of course, back to Shiddha Maharaj. That's, that's what he was wanted more than anything else, is to be absorbed in Kirtan. Every day, every night in his room, chanting with devotees. Very eager simply to hear the holy names. Taking shelter of the holy names. This is the best way to be prepared for uh, to take shelter and fully depend on Krishna's decision. If one can call out the transcendental names of the Lord, time of death, certainly one can be assured. Antakalichamamivas smaranokvakalevam. Prabhupada says right here, guaranteed. Guaranteed. Guaranteed protection. And Krishna himself says, of this there's no doubt. 
Whoever remembers me at the time of giving up this body and once attains my transcendental nature. Of this, there's no doubt. Guaranteed. Krishna gives a lot of guarantees. Of course, he lets his devotees give guarantees too. But Krishna says, yummy mum. What is that? I forgot the verse. Yamam Paramam, what is it? For, for one who explains the supreme secret to devotees, for him devotional service is guaranteed. And at the end he comes back to me. There's no servant in this world more dear to me than he, nor will there ever be one more dear to me. So he says, For one who explains the supreme secret, what is the supreme secret? The supreme message of Bhagavad Gita claims the supreme secret, then he guarantees he gets devotional service and at the end he comes back to me. Many times he gives guarantees. Savadamam paricha jamami tvam saranam vraja maham tam savapapya moksha shami masu chaha Don't fear. Don't fear. Guarantee. Don't fear. And Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur we oftentimes quote he, he says that when Krishna is telling Arjuna, Masuchaha, surrender to me, don't fear, he says that what Krishna is speaking about is the previous verse. He says that all the components of surrender were in the previous verse. Well, what does anybody know what the previous verse was? Bhava mad bhaktao mad yaji mam namaskaro. Yes. These were the components of surrender. He said, Manmana bhava mad bhakta. Think of me. Worship me. Offer your prayers unto me. Surely he will come to me. Surely he will come to me. This is the safest place to be in remembrance. Remembrance of Krishna. In remembrance. And uh, every opportunity we can get to try to remember what is the safest place in this world. And every opportunity we get to try to remember, like a verse like this by Pallad Maharaj, where he says, uh, because of a bodily conception of life, embodied souls neglected and not cared for by you cannot do anything for their benefit. Whatever remedies they may accept, although perhaps temporarily beneficial, they're not permanent. Temporarily beneficial, but not permanent. Essentially what he's saying is full dependence on the Lord is, is the best way to be protected because there's no other remedial measure that can put a permanent solution to the permanent problems of life in this world. Certified. Dukaliyam. Ashashwa. One other story. I've told this story. I love this story. Lakshmi Mani knows the story. She heard it. I think I told it in Toronto when it was there last year. When uh, Shura Maharaj was... Uh, he had asked me to come, every, to come in the evenings to chant. And one evening I, I couldn't... I had a terrible headache. It was after a long day of meetings. And, uh, and I was thinking that uh, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to go tonight. This is a really bad headache. So uh, I wrote a note to Mayapur and on the note I said, Mayapur, please tell Srinu Maharaj, I apologize. I have a real bad headache tonight. And I'm not going to make it. And uh, I sent it up to the room and I began walking back to my room. And while I was walking back to my room, I was thinking, I'll wait. <laughs> I was walking back to him, I was thinking, I got a headache. <laughs> and sure, I was just lying in his bed, preparing to leave this world from liver cancer and I have a headache and I can't go and, and chant <laughs> just by thinking about that I felt like a fool <laughs> and I immediately I was turned around 
<laughs> and I went back to the room. And uh, I opened up the door to the room, and the room was, as always, every evening was filled with devotees chanting. And I didn't want to disturb anybody. And, uh, and uh, I stood by the doorway. And then Shri Maharaj looked up and saw me. He said, Naranjan Maharaj. I, he said, come here. So I said, Maharaj, there's so many devotees in the room. I don't want to disturb anybody, please. And then he sat up. He said, come here. And he told the devotees. Make room. I didn't know what he wanted. He, he slapped the bed. And uh, I thought, well, maybe he's going to ask me to give a talk or something like that. I had, I had no idea what to expect why he was calling me in this way. So I sat down, and he sat up, cross-legged on the bag, and he turned to my airport and said, give me the tiger bomb. <laughs> <laughs> tiger bomb is a solve for headaches? <laughs> so he said, give me the tiger bomb. And he took the tiger bomb, and I started massaging my head right there on the bed. And with a really I mean, strong grip, I said, Maharaj, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and it went on, you know, for uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes while Kirtan was going on. I had to accept it. You know, how can you not accept, you know, how can you not accept? I was embarrassed, but yeah, here is, he's thinking of me, thinking of my headache. Like, like Hari Das Thakur, who was thinking of the prison guards who were beating them. <laughs> you know, it's like, he's being beaten in 22 marketplaces, and he saw the anxiety on their face, and he said, why are you in so much in anxiety? And the prison guard says, well, we've been ordered to beat you to death, but you won't die. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't die, we'll be beaten to death. And Hari Das Thakur felt compassion for them. <laughs> wasn't thinking of his own suffering. He's thinking of other suffering. This is real compassion. Real compassion. Yeah. This is what Bhaktivinoda Thakur prays for. When will I become so compassionate? Then I will set out to preach your order sublime. When or when will that day be mine? When I feel compassion towards all living entities. This is, uh, this is what Srila Prabhupada has given us. This is what he's given. He's given us the remedy. <laughs> the remedy. Not some temporary remedy. He's given us the real remedy. And he didn't compromise. You know, he, not only did he, he set the bar but by his instructions, but he set the bar by his example. Sometimes I listen. If you ever want to have a transcendental treat, I compiled, uh, I got it all the, together, all the 1977 conversations of Srila Prabhupada and listened to them consecutively. Transcendental treat. Because you get to hear again and again how Prabhupada was so detached from the body and so instructive. Preparing us. Preparing us. This is what it means. When he said, don't think this won't happen to you, but Prabhupada was experiencing it, and at the same time was so transcendental. And you get to hear from time to time this interspersed with this Prabhupada's health worsened and worsened and how Prabhupada also, he would dismiss it as his body's a bag of bones, it has to go. The only thing that kept him obviously was the love from his disciples. <laughs> you know, was, he felt so much love from his disciples and he felt strong desire to reciprocate that love and increase our attachment. But uh, we need such examples. If we have examples, then we have hope. So if there are no examples, there's no hope. But if there are examples, we have hope. Whatever examples we can find, we have to 
We have to build our faith on that, invest our faith in those examples. That's why they're there. That's why Krishna put his devotees in difficult circumstances to show the world. This is how my devotee deals with these situations. Devotee is transcendental. Barashya kata mishta shrinvanti kati yanti cha. The panti vividas tapa naitama gachachetasa. Engaged constantly in hearing and chanting about me. My devotees don't suffer material miseries because they're always filled with thoughts of my activities and pastimes. Oh, my mother, a virtuous lady, seek out the association of such persons. You seek out their association, they will counteract all the pernicious effects of your material attachments. What is that verse? Every learned person knows that attachment to material things is the cause of bondage for the living entity. Moksha dua. But the same attachment is applied to self-realized devotees, moksha dvama pavrita. Then the gate to liberation is opened. Anyways, these are a few thoughts I have on this verse by Prahlad Maharaj. They're pretty spontaneous. As you can see, it wasn't the prepared class. <laughs> But if I talk about Shri Maharaj, <laughs> I know something of <coughs> substance, something of substance to talk about. <laughs> he was a devotee of substance. <laughs> and he's the example among many that we have to learn from. I can think of so many other examples. And I remember the <laughs> anyways, I can go on and on thinking of examples. They're there. They're there, and they're there for us. We should look for them and become attached to hearing about them, become attached to remembering them, become attached to speaking about them, and uh, hopefully, Shushushal Shanadanis Yavasudeva Kataruchi Sangmaya Siviyavi Paponyatirta Nishevana. By serving those devotees who are freed from vice, great service is done. By that service, we become attached to hearing and chanting about Krishna. And our life can become successful. This is why Srila Prabhupada established this Krishna consciousness movement, to give everyone the opportunity to become successful. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Would you like any comments? Gokul and would like to share something with us? I do that personal from the heart. Just to your conclusion that uh, Shri Papa, he wanted the whole world to come back to Krishna. And he, he set up his ISKCON as a perfect, fast network to give everyone a chance to attain that process. As we're serving Prabhupada's mission at ISKCON. And thus he can reward us with that, not to the Pitaguchi. And Prabhupada's representatives. It's, it's all a continuous thing. I have a very short story. Can I say something? That? I was just reading Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur's commentary to the verse, Naisham Matis Tavad Urukamangrin. This verse, Pallad Maharaj, Pallad Maharaj, so. <laughs> Pallad Maharaj was. was dealing with Hiranyakashipu's anger. Hiranyakashipu was trying to figure out, how did my son become so Krishna conscious? <laughs> how did it happen? I told him to go to Sunday. <coughs> how, how did this happen to you? And then Prahlad quoted three very important verses. He said, that because of their uncontrolled senses, persons very much attached towards the materialistic life make progress towards hellish conditions of life and repeatedly chew that which has already been chewed. Their inclinations towards Krishna are never aroused, either by their own efforts, by the efforts of others, or by a combination of both. And then the next verse, he says, Nate Vidu Vishnu. He describes how persons should be very careful, persons who are very much attached towards material enjoyment. They uh, and who accepted their leader, a similarly material attached man, uh, 
and they do not know that the purpose of life is to go back home, back to Godhead, and render his service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. His blind men, led by another blind man, missed the right path and followed to the tip, into the ditch. Similarly, materially attached men, led by another materially attached man, are bound by the ropes of their fruit of labor, which is made of very strong cords. And thus they have to undergo repeated birth and death in this material world. So, Prahlad says, first, what happens to persons who don't, you know, who are attached? They make progress, but their progress is, they make progress towards hellish conditions of life. And then he says, Naishamati Stavarudukra Green. He says, unless they smear upon their body the dust from the lotus feet of a devotee who is completely freed from material attachments, but one cannot become attached to the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So there's no other, uh, only by rendering service to the Lord in this way can one actually become free from material contamination. So he says one has to get the dust from the devotee. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur in his commentary, he says the dust from the lotus feet of the devotee means to take bath in the knowledge and the example of the pure devotees. He says that's what it means to take. There's another meaning. Of course, we know there are three very powerful substances in this world. The dust, the prasadam, food remnants from the devotee, and the water that bathed the lotus feet. They're a very powerful substance. The whole story of Jadu Thakur and Kalidas uh, is, is given in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Yes, dust is important. But he makes the point that... Dust also means to take a bath in the knowledge and the example of great devotees. So, Srila Prabhupada's knowledge and his example, the dust is still available. Forever. <laughs> still available. <laughs> knowledge and example. And of course, there's that wonderful verse also in the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam and the prayers of the demigods when it talks about how the Lord is very merciful. He was like like, uh, like a wish-fulfilling desire tree because he accepts the process by which the Acharyas cross the ocean. He accepts the method by which they cross, by which they cross, but he's so kind that although they, he accepts their method, he leaves, they leave behind the method for others, for his other devotees. <laughs> for his other devotees. It makes, and the very... And, and Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur and also in his commentary says that, that uh, the bhakti movements that are left behind by great acharyas are the methods for crossing. Whatever methods they accepted to cross, it's still, the boat is still here on this side. They've crossed and the boat is still here on this side to cross. So again, evidence to confirm your point. That was, that was prophetic of this Vishwanath. This was what? You wanted to say something. Yes. <laughs> I have a short story, but exactly exemplifies uh, your wonderful uh, appreciation for Sri Maharaj. Actually, uh, this happened two, two months after, after his actual departure. He had come back to Vancouver to finally have a very long awaited meeting with his doctors because they were going to revive Two months before, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure I understood it right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of his, that he was a body, he was totally 
beyond the fear of death. Because, I mean, when he told me two months, I was got a little shook up. I said, my God, my gosh, that's really not good news. It's that he was so interested in echo. He was just very spontaneous and he felt really comfortable with the whole situation of his imminent death or departure, you know. And then uh, I was so shook up, he was consoling me that it was not so bad. <laughs> you know, I was like, whoa. And then about five minutes later, as Mayapur was there, and he came in and he said, so Mayapur, you think we can have a shot him now? Uh, and then he gave a, a list. He said, I'm two veggie burgers. Because <laughs> there were some of his disciples back in the Vancouver Temple ready to whatever, you know, serve him in any way. So he still wanted to enjoy that nice Prashad. <laughs> yeah, same thing happened to him in Carpinteria. Yeah. And he went into a coma. But, but, he, but he was really uh, beyond the body, really. You know, he was not putting on a show. It was like I was quite moved by his you know, state of consciousness. Well, everyone knows I'm somewhat of a rascal. So anyway, <clears throat> but it ties into your class and the points you were making. Because one day I got a call. I mean, Sridhar Maharaj would see him in you know, different places in India and so forth. And he was such a sweet devotee. And he had no pretense. You know, he, was, he could just talk to anybody. You know, I mean, he's this lovable person. And... Um, so he, all of the group. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. So I was just expressing how much I'm a little different. <laughs> I'm a, yeah, I'm a little rascal. Anyway, um, Shida Marsh, we know him and you know, we see him in India and so forth. And he's such a nice, jolly person and very friendly and, you know, ready to talk to anybody. He had, he had no airs about himself. So he was such a lovable person. But one day I got a call. I'm home and I get a call and it's Sri Maharaj. I'm like, what? You know? I mean, how did he even get my number? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of disconnected. <clears throat> and he's telling me he's in Mexico and he's getting some treatment. So it ties into the point of his duty. He was doing kind of his duty, you know, take care of the body, okay, and so forth. And, um, and I'm like, Maharaj, you're in Mexico, what are you doing there? So I'm going to some treatment and so forth. So my reaction out of, you know, which wasn't my position, but out, out of concern, I said, Maharaj, why are you doing this? You know, you should go to Mayapur, and if you're going to die, die in Mayapur, because you could die there in Mexico, you know. And I said, you've, you've already accomplished perfection. I mean, you know, you've, you've served Prabhupada so nicely, you're a sannyasi, I mean, what more can you attain? I was kind of preaching opposite of what you were preaching to him. And I said, Maharaj, if you go to Mayapur and you leave your body, it'll be a wonderful example for us. We need examples, you know, of people who are demonstrating their detachment and, you know, like that. And that would be really inspiring for us. So later I heard that he was in Mayapur. I didn't get a chance to go there. But Gore was there, and when he came in, Immediately, she know, I said, hey, where's your friend Lakshmi now? <laughs> so he was such a, you know, wonderful person. I mean, there are devotees like that. I mean, there's, every devotee is sweet, but there are devotees like, like that, you know, that uh, are Bhakti Tirta or, I mean, there were such sweet devotees. It's just uh, incredible that, you know, we, we miss them. We miss those devotees. Okay,